So the reason that I showed that video clip is because many times we kind of walk around like that Doberman. We feel all tough and we think we're we think that we just got our spiritual big boy and big girl pants on that day and we're like we're just ready to take on the devil. And the devil comes into our space and he just kind of weaves us around and gets us distracted and takes us all over. And before long, we find out that that we're on a much shorter leash than what we realize. And all of our talk doesn't mean anything. You see, the thing is about a, a dog on a leash, they don't really know that they're on a leash. They don't really mind it as long as they stay within their normal space. But as soon as they try to get outside of that space, They come to the end very quickly, and it's kind of a sudden jolt. (laughs) Have you ever noticed that around a dog, a dog house, where a dog is on a leash all the time, what does the ground look like? It's dirt, right? The grass is gone. The life is gone. The beauty is gone because they've just worn it down to nothing. Because that's that's their space. That's their area. And the thing is about a dog that's been on a leash for a long time, They don't even try to go anymore. They don't even try to go beyond that dead space, that dead area, because they've gotten so used to being on the chain that it's broken them. It's broken them to where they know they can't move forward. They can't go beyond what the chain allows. And this morning, some of you are on a chain. The devil has beat you down, and the devil has convinced you that you can't move any further, that you can't move ahead with your life, that you can't go anywhere, and you've worn down your space in your life, and now you're in the blahs, now you're in this dead zone that you've worn down and you've gone over and you've gone in circle and circle and circle and circle, and there's nothing left, and so you're just laying down with your head between your paws, and you're just waiting for the days to go by, because life has lost its meaning and its value and it's purpose. But that's not what Jesus has for you. Jesus has so much more. I used to have one of these chains. And this chain started in my life several years ago. I was, I was 18 years old and I was being discipled by my mentor. And I was in his office and it was me and another guy. And, and we were kind of in competition, but it was a good competition. It drove us to go further and further in our faith and try new things. And and one day we were sitting in there and, and our mentor gave us both this prophetic word that he felt the Holy Spirit had shown him. And he told my friend, he said, I see for you that you're going to stand up in front of multitudes, that you're going to stand up and you're going to fill theaters and auditoriums and stadiums and you're going to speak in front of tens of thousands of people with the gospel. And, he, and then he turned to me and he said, and Tanner, and I'm like, yeah. He's like, I see you working with smaller groups with groups of 50s and, and hundreds, and I, and I see you pouring into to smaller groups of people. And, and he meant it to be encouraging. And you know what it did to my spirit? It crushed it. Because I wanted to stand in front of the stadium. I wanted to be in front of the thousands. I wanted to be the mega church pastor. I wanted to be known across the nation and have books and all of this stuff. I wanted to have the success. And I carried that with me for years and years and years. This this thought in my mind of why can't I be the guy? Why can't I be up in front of the stadiums? Why can't I have the thousands? Why can't I be that person? And it wasn't until I came to this church seven and a half years ago that God began to reveal to me a new vision, something that he'd been speaking to my heart for years, but I dismissed it because I wanted the thousands. And God began to give me a vision, a renewed vision of a church that stays a a certain size so that one pastor can know every person and one pastor can love his flock and his sheep. And instead of doing this, and there's nothing against big churches, all right? But instead of having this mega church organizational structure where you never actually have a conversation with a pastor, that every person in the church can actually be ministered. And instead of one church of 10,000 having one pastor, having hundreds of pastors come out of a church and go pastor churches of two, three, 400 in size. That's our vision here at this church. 
Not to grow bigger than our building, but to fill up this building and then send out pastors like Frank and like Sean and like the other pastors that we're raising up in our ministry school. That we don't have to build bigger buildings and send millions on those projects, but we can take that money and those resources and we, everybody gets a chance to use their gifts. It wasn't until I let go of the fantasy that I was able to receive the vision. Do you understand the difference? It wasn't until I laid down the fantasy of what I wanted that I was able to pick up the dream of what God had for me. And it set me free. Because I was that dog that was going around and killing the grass because I wasn't going any further. And Satan was fine as long as I was staying put. It's a good boy. But as soon as I tried to move beyond that area, man, the leash got really tight really fast. But I don't live that way anymore. I don't pursue the things that I want. I'm pursuing the dream that God has given. And there's such greener grass in that. This morning, in Genesis chapter 45, we're going to learn six mindsets that will help us move forward in our lives. Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. It says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. For they were dismayed at his presence. If you remember where we're at in this story, this is Joseph, the favored son of Jacob, who had the coat of many colors. His brothers grew jealous of him. They threw him in a pit, faked his death, sold him into slavery. Joseph went into slavery. He was a slave for years, got thrown into prison. And then by God's grace, God lifted him out of the prison and put him in second in control of all Egypt. Years later, 22 years later, his brothers come down to Egypt looking for food. And Joseph begins to give them a series of tests. Last week, we looked at the last test. And today, we're looking at the rest of the story. So Joseph has now become overcome with his emotions. And he begins to experience something that he has not experienced up to this point. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Up until this point, he'd still been kind of hard in his heart and kind of resistant to forgiving. So he'd been giving test after test after test. And now he reveals himself to his brothers. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of would like to see how this scene played out. Like, I hope that when we get to heaven, there's this, this humongous jumbotron where we get to watch stories in the Bible. Like, you know, when Samson killed 800 guys with a donkey jawbone. Like, that's, I kind of want to see that. That's better than any Schwarzenegger movie that's ever been made, right? I mean, that's, that's real life. That's something that actually happened. I want to see that played out. I want to see David take down Goliath. I want to see these, uh, these 11 brothers wedding themselves when they realize that the guy they thought they, they sold into slavery is actually now the head of Egypt. I mean, I, I understand why they were dismayed. Can you imagine the thoughts they had running through their heads? Well, the first mindset that I want to show you this morning that will allow you to move forward with your life is forgiveness. Forgiveness is so important in so many ways. If you do not forgive, it holds you captive, not the person that you don't forgive. Many times you hold, I hold things against people, they don't even know that we're upset about it. They think we've moved on and we're holding back, we're holding down and it's anchoring us and not allowing us to move forward when they've gone on a long time ago. The only person that unforgiveness hurts is us. The only person that it really, truly affects negatively is us. And then the people that we hurt in the process. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Bearing with one another, and if one of us has a complaint against another, we forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. We don't have an excuse not to forgive someone. 
We might have all kinds of reasons that we're upset with them. They might even be valid reasons. People do nasty, horrible things all the time. But none of us has a right not to forgive because Jesus has forgiven us. Unforgiveness will destroy your life. This week, Jason and I were doing a tree job, and we got there, and it was kind of a weird situation. This this lady that we were doing the job for, she outwardly stated that she hated her next door neighbor who owned the tree that we were working on. She was paying for the limbs to be cut off from over her home, but she hated this person. And so the neighbor that owned the tree came out and was slowly taking the wood that we were cutting down and he was taking it for his fire pit. You know where it was going to go? It was going to be thrown into a ravine otherwise. We, when we get done with the tree, the lady comes out and goes, where's the wood? Uh, did that guy take it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to throw it away. She's like, I want it all in the ravine. I want it all to go to waste because I don't want them to have anything. Who's getting hurt there? It's destroying her. It's destroying her. This is what unforgiveness does. Unforgiveness destroys us like a cancer from the inside out. You know what the alternative to forgiving someone is? It's holding on to unforgiveness. You know what the problem with unforgiveness is? Satan wants to set your life on fire. And every time you are unwilling to forgive someone, you're throwing gas on the fire. It looks like this. Every time you, fear, you refuse to forgive someone... You're throwing gas on the fire and you're setting yourself on flames instead of them. Matthew chapter, no, it's not Sean. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. If you do not forgive others their wrongs, your heavenly Father will also, I'm sorry, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Guys, this is heaven and hell we're talking about. This isn't, well, you're just going to live an unhappy life. No, this is your soul that's at stake. If you refuse to forgive someone, then you are refusing forgiveness from Jesus because you don't get what you won't give. This is God's rule. If you refuse to forgive another, God will not forgive you what you have done. Does forgiveness mean that you don't still hurt and you don't still think about it? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means you begin the process of letting them go. It means you begin the process of demanding their eternal punishment for what they've done wrong because you don't want your eternal punishment demanded. You begin to give it into the hands of God. Genesis 45 verse 9 continues the story. It says, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph. Whom you sold into Egypt. Do you think they needed that reminder? No, I don't. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither growing. I'm sorry, neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. The second mindset that I want to share with you this morning that we need to have to be able to move forward with our lives is perspective. Perspective is hard. Because perspective means that we have this willingness to look at the situation and understand why. Perspective is not denying that something happened. Denial is not perspective. Perspective is not sweeping something underneath the rug and pretending that it didn't happen. What did Joseph say to his brothers? Hey guys, remember how you sold me down into slavery to Egypt? It's not ignoring it. It's not pretending that it didn't happen. It's recognizing that it happened, but trying to understand why. 
Perspective is a gift from God. And ultimately, i got to be honest with you, it's not something you're always going to have. You're not always going to get an answer to why. But many times, if we're willing to ask the right questions the right ways, we will begin to see things. You know that hurt people hurt people? Have you ever heard that expression? People that have been abused often abuse others. People that are in misery love company. So when people do things to us, instead of holding on to that and becoming angrier and angrier, sometimes it's freeing for us if we will seek to understand why that person did what they did. It doesn't make it go away. It doesn't make it okay. But it can help set us free from hanging on to what they've done to us. Romans 8.28 is the Bible's clearest depiction of perspective. It says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Now I want you to see this, and we say this here a lot. God does not say all things are good, does He? He says He will work all things together for good. How mighty is our God? Our God is so mighty that He can take the worst of the worst of the worst situations and still bring good out of it. If we allow Him. But this requires perspective. And it requires trust, and it requires a knowledge that our God is working for us, and if He is for us, no one can be against us. But there is an alternative to perspective. That's bitterness. Bitterness will throw gas on Satan's fire. Hebrews 12, 5 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. You have to guard your heart against bitterness. And the way that you do this is you ask God for perspective. You ask God to under, for understanding. You ask God to show you things to help you understand what's going on better because perspective allows you to look at being sold into slavery having your death fake being abandoned being then treated horribly for 20 years it allows you to take all of that and say but i can still see that god accomplished something good now i want to say this in the middle of it it sucks right that's a strong word but it does honestly But as you're going through and as you're getting through on the other side, all right, God, show me your glory. All right, God, show me your faithfulness. All right, God, show me who you are. Show me your goodness because he will. He will bring good even out of the worst of circumstances. Genesis chapter 45, verse 10. It says, you will dwell in the land of Goshen. Now, this is Joseph talking to his brothers. You're going to do and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. Joseph is second in command over Egypt. Do you think his his pad is a a nasty place? No, he lives in the best spot. And he's telling his brothers, now you're going to get to come and live in the best spot. There I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now... Your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father and all of all my honor in Egypt, and of all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. Then Joseph fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and he wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck, and he kissed all of his brothers, and he wept upon them. After this, his brothers talked with him. Despite everything they've done to him, what does Joseph promise them? I will provide for you. Mindset number three that we have to develop in order to move forward, we have to be generous. Even with those who've hurt us, even with our enemies. Matthew 5, says, but I say to you, this is Jesus, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who do wrong to you 
so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, only your friends, what more are you doing than anyone else? Do not even the Gentiles or the sinners do that? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Guys, this is a huge standard to try to reach, and you can't do it on your own. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, only by the grace of the Holy Spirit in you that you can be generous toward even your enemies. But I'll tell you this, you will never experience anything more freeing in this life than doing good to someone who has wronged you. Because you know what you do? You take off the leash in that moment. When you are at the place where you can do good to those who have wronged you, when you can forgive and have perspective and show love to those who hate you, you're taking off the devil's leash. He no longer has any power, any control over your life because you are working purely in the power of Jesus Christ. But there's an alternative to this. The alternative is withholding. You have it in your power to withhold from your enemies. You have it in your power to withhold from those who have hurt you. When the opportunity comes up, you can do good, but you can also withhold it. But you know what happens when you withhold? You throw gas on the enemy's fire. Proverbs 3.27 says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Okay, Pastor Tanner, I got an escape plan here. See, right there it says, do not hold due from those whom it is, do it. Well, obviously they don't deserve it. They did me wrong. They hurt me. They cheated me. They lied to me. They hurt me. They talked about me. They did this. They did that. Obviously they don't deserve good. Well, in the previous passage, what did Jesus say? My father sends rain on the just and the unjust. My father blesses the good and the bad. My father gives to him everybody out of his common grace out of his common love so if good is coming to someone then it's their due this is the words of jesus this is not an easy thing but he says do not withhold because you know who you're actually withholding from you're withholding from god and you're withholding from yourself Genesis 45, 16 goes on. It says, when the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers had come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt to your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Joseph was merciful to his brothers. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You see, when you're merciful, you will receive mercy from God. When you show mercy on other people, instead of hurting them, instead of trying to get back at them, then you will receive mercy when you deserve someone to hurt you or get back at you. You will receive mercy from God. Our fourth mindset this morning that we have to learn is be merciful. But you know what the alternative is? The alternative to mercy is revenge. Revenge is us trying to pay back what we think someone else deserves. But God's very clear in the scriptures. He says, revenge belongs to me and me alone. Because I'm the only one here who's perfect. I'm the only one here who sees clearly. I'm the only one here who gets to decide who gets punished and who doesn't. Revenge belongs to me. Luke 6.36 says, be merciful even as your father is perfect merciful. God's not asking you to do anything you have not already done. I'm sorry. God is not asking you to do anything he's not already done. If you need an example of God's mercy, all you have to do is look at the cross. Jesus killed his kid 
sorry, God killed his kid, Jesus, in his mercy for us. Anybody in here willing to sacrifice their child for their worst enemy? I mean, we've got some enemies in the world. We've got Hamas, Al-Qaeda, ISIS. We got all these groups that want to destroy us. Iran calls us the great Satan. Anybody in here signing up to murder your child for one of them? For one of these terrorists who want to come in and, and rape, steal, murder, and kill everything that you, that you cherish and that you love? Anybody going to sign up to give their children for that? I'm not. But God did. God said that while we were yet sinners, he gave his son for us. While we were still his enemies, he gave his his son for us. We always look at it from the perspective of, well, I love Jesus now, so now I understand that he died for me. No, 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 no. Jesus loved you and died for you when you wanted nothing to do with him, when you cared nothing about him. The Father did that. Proverbs 25, 21 says, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will reap, I'm sorry, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. The Bible actually gives us one way scripturally to have revenge on our enemies. You know how it is? To bless them. You want the ultimate form of revenge on your enemy? Bless them. Love them. Be kind to them. Do good to them. Scripturally, it says it's going to be like reaping coals on their head. You know why it's going to be like coals on their head? Because if they reject it, they're going to hate every minute of it. But that's not up for us to decide. All that is up for us to do is to do good to everybody because it sets us free. Be merciful, for your Father is merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What did Joseph tell his brothers? You know what? You can come here and you can live by me. You guys come on down and I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. He was giving mercy. Then Pharaoh said, Joseph, come here. Now I know, Joseph, that you said that you were going to take care of your family. You were going to take care of your brothers. But now I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it on my dime with my resources. I'm going to send a whole caravan of goods to get them and a whole caravan of goods to bring them back. I'm going to give them land. I'm going to take care of them. It's not going to cost you anything, Joseph. I'm going to do this. Joseph showed mercy. God showed mercy. Pharaoh blessed Joseph and blessed his family because Joseph was willing to bless. You want to throw gas on the enemy's fire? You want to withhold your blessing? You want to walk in revenge? Do you really want revenge for all the things that you deserve revenge for? Because I don't. Matthew 45, um, 25. I'm sorry, Matthew 45, 21. It says, so the sons of Israel did so. Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh. He gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them, he gave a change of clothes, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father, he sent as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he says to them, and I love this, hey, don't fight along the way. Does he kind of have a right to say this? Yeah, because Joseph knows that his brothers left to themselves are a bunch of jerks. So Joseph says, hey guys, you have been blessed. You have been forgiven. You've been shown mercy. So don't fight along the way. You know what Jesus is saying to us today? I saved you. I pulled you out of that pit. I went looking for you when no one else wanted anything to do with you. Even in the midst of your grossness, your depravity, your sinfulness, your brokenness, I saved you. So love other people. Stop trying to cause problems. Stop gossiping. Stop talking about other people. Stop judging other people. Who the heck do you think you are? Do you need a mirror? To remember, do you want me to pull out the picture book so that you can see what you were like, what you were doing? Who the heck do you think you are to judge anybody else? To create disunity? To try to form cliques? Oh yeah, well this is our little group, but we don't like that little group. Man, that's gross. 
That's gross. Who do we think we are to do these things? Proverbs 12, 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. The fifth mindset that we need to develop if we want to move forward in life is we need to be peacemakers. Now, I want you to see something here. It says, if at all possible. There will be times in your life where it will not be possible for you to live at peace with people because of just who they are and where they're at in their lives. That's when you set up boundaries. It's okay to have boundaries. But if it is possible, if you are capable of being at peace with someone, then you become a peacemaker. Joseph's brothers were naturally bent toward quarreling and infighting. So he reminds them, don't fight along the way. Rejoice in the goodness of what you have. And you know what he's saying to us today? Don't be picking fights all the time. Don't be getting offended all the time. You know, some people walk around with the thinnest skin imaginable. And they get offended by everything. Well, I don't really like the color of that carpet. I don't really like how he said hi to me. I don't really like how he gave me that 20 bucks. I don't really like, I don't really. It's not about us. It's not about us. You can give everything to some people and they will still find something to complain about. That's not the way of Christ. And it's not walking around trying to find what's wrong with everyone else. Because we got plenty of stuff to work on right here. I don't go around telling everybody what's wrong with their car because my car is a mess. <laughs> right? Not for long. Proverbs 6, 16. There are six things that the Lord hates. Did you guys hear that language? God hates this stuff. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that go quickly to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. You know why churches fail in our country? Because of gossip. You know why churches fail in our country? It's not because we don't have enough Christians. It's not because we don't have enough money. It's not because we don't have enough gifts. It's not because we don't have enough creativity. It's because we talk crap. And we build up walls. And we build teams. So you know what? I'm on the Sean team. No, I'm on the Jason team. And so I go over and I tell Jason all this stuff Sean said about him. And then I run over to, to well, I heard it. <laughs> don't ever sit on the front row, guys. I mean, it's just, that's where it's going to happen. But this is what we do, and we tear each other down instead of building each other up. And Jesus says, stop quarreling. I've given you everything you need for the journey. You've been forgiven. You've been blessed. You've been shown mercy. You should be going out of your mind with love for everybody else. Stop fighting with each other. Genesis 45, verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt, and they came to, came to the land of Canaan, to their father Jacob, and they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt, and his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive, and I will go and see him before I die. The sixth thing that we need to do, the sixth mindset that we need to develop in order to move forward, we need to restore hope. Psalm 39, verse 7 says, And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. You know where our hope comes from? It doesn't come in our paycheck. It doesn't come in job security. It doesn't come in a relationship. It doesn't come in our vehicle or our house or our bank account. It doesn't come in our looks. It doesn't come in our personality. It doesn't come in our creativity. Our hope is found only in Jesus Christ because that is the only hope that is lasting and enduring. We can't rely on ourselves. Our hope has to be in Him. We have to wait upon Him. Him. He has to be the source or we're constantly going to be frustrated and disappointed. And if you're living a frustrated, disappointed life, it's because your hope is somewhere else other than Jesus. 
Ephesians 4.29 it says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. We want to give grace through our words. You know what the alternative to hope is? Negativity. You guys know who Eeyore is and Winnie the Pooh? My girls are into, like, Winnie the Pooh right now. I... I don't get it. I think they look at Winnie and they think of Daddy and it kind of bothers me a little bit. <laughs> Tubby little cubby all stuffed with fluff. I mean, come on. But Eeyore drives me nuts, man. Because he's the biggest bummer on the planet. Like, at some point, I would have tied that donkey up and just walked away from him. He's just such a bummer. Everything that's going on. Isn't it a beautiful, sunshiny day? Oh, uh, but the rain is coming, you know? And some people are like this. Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful for that new house? Yeah, but man, I know the gutters are going to have to be cleaned. <laughs> yeah? You have a house. Aren't you thankful for that job? Yeah, but I got to work some overtime. <laughs> but you have food. You have a cell phone. You have you can pay bills. You have more wealth as the poorest income earners in America than the richest people in 1890 did. We have a higher standard of living than t people from any time in any place of history have ever had, and that's our low income earners. We have supermarkets. We have indoor plumbing. Thank you, Jesus. We have lights. We have air conditioning. Kings lived with less. And we complain. And we go to work and we give Jesus a bad name because we're a bunch of self-centered, miserable jerks. Do you want to come to church with me? No! They're happy at the bar. You're miserable. This is not the wife of Christ. This is not the way he intends for us to live we're to live with hope because we've been given hope because we have the source of hope. We have life. So here's the deal. Just give me one minute. This is heaven and hell. This really is this morning. It's heaven and hell. Because some of you are here this morning, and the person that you can't forgive is God. Because you've misplaced other people's bad decisions on God. And you need to restore that relationship. Some of us this morning are mad at other people, and we refuse to re forgive. We refuse to be reconciled. Guess what? That's, that's hell, guys. Because if you refuse to be reconciled to a person... You refuse to be reconciled to Jesus. Some of us this morning just need to get rid of the bitterness. Some of us this morning just need to get rid of the misery. Some of us just need some restored hope. But this is what Jesus offers us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. That's where we're going. And this is what the people heard as hope was restored. Son of David, Hosanna to the Son of David. David. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. David. Hosanna to the Son of 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 David. 
Yeah, you got to get one more in. That's all right. Give God praise this morning. Yeah. They began to lay down their coats. They began to cut off palm branches. They began to lay down um, blankets, everything they could at the feet of the donkey Jesus was riding into the city on. And it was a donkey for a reason. You see, if Jesus would have ridden to the Jerusalem on a horse, he would have been proclaiming himself a warrior king coming to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. But he rode in on a donkey. When a king rode a donkey, it was a symbol of peace, that Jesus was entering the city in a peaceful way to bring peace to the people. And the people began to shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. They began to yell out, save us, save us, salvation has come, save us, save us. Now they were yelling, save us from their oppressor, save us from the Roman government. They did not realize that they were proclaiming and calling in the salvation of their souls. They were prophesying the salvation they had been waiting upon for thousands of years as Jesus rode in to Jerusalem, rode to his death upon a cross that he would rise from the dead three days later and save us. Hope has been restored. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday because we celebrate the fact that Jesus did not turn to the right or to the left. Jesus rode straight to his death because he was going to rise. And Jesus is no longer dead. He has risen from the grave. And we have hope restored. We have hope. And so this morning... You do not have to leave this place without hope. I love what Pastor Linda said. It is a decision. Are you going to keep the doors of your heart closed? Are you going to leave them shut? Because Revelation 3.20 says, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking. He wants to come in. He wants to bring peace. He wants to bring joy. He wants to bring life. He wants to bring love. But it is your choice today. This week, will you please take time to consider what this week means? In the midst of your busyness, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of work and play and sports and activity, will you please remember what this week means? Friday night, we're going to celebrate in here, and we're going to do a special illustration to remind you of just exactly what Jesus performed on the cross. Sunday, we're going to bring the gospel in a living, active, powerful way so that people can receive Jesus Christ. But for those of you who already know him, would you please let this week be a week where you focus back on the cross and you receive the hope that has already been won for you. Two people, amen. All right, so let's pray. Father, we need you. Jesus, we need more of you. Help us to put these six mindsets into practice. You promise to renew our minds in Romans 12.1, that you will renew our minds and let us become living sacrifices. Help us this week to turn our hearts to you. Help us to open the door of our heart to let you in. And Lord, we invite you, come in. Come in and save. Come in and heal. Come in and deliver. Come in and set us free. Come in and help us to live for you. Because to you alone belongs the glory. In Jesus' name.